I want to invite up uh, Leda Aguirre to, uh, to give her, her uh, their presentation. Um, and uh, Leda is an assistant professor at, of architecture at uh, the University of Michigan's Tobin uh, College of Architecture. Yes, college. I have to remember because we're in a school here. Um, and uh, uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are an architectural designer and a director of Stock A Studio. Um, Leda is interested in the circulation of materials and commodities, so that's perfect for this uh, panel here. Uh, their research focuses on the way our built environment is affected by the politics of aesthetics, logistics, and media. So I invite you forward. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm pretty excited to uh, get to talk after Jesse. I feel like in some way we've been, I've been kind of like, I felt some kind of kinship to your work, albeit a kind of like more eccentric kinship. Um, from the distance, I'm, I'm uh, pretty excited. Um, thanks for the invite. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be presenting sort of a, a bunch of work, uh, old and new, using kind of the, the invite to the symposium as a prompt to think through uh, the work through sort of like three distinct uh, themes, um, which I've been sort of working on. Um, so it could be a bit uh, choppy, just go with me. Uh, I also have a tendency to get kind of a little statement-y at the top and then super designery after. Um, so that's happening here. <laughs> uh, spam in your inbox, junk in your mailbox, uh, you pay for your storage, TMI, full thumb drive. All the drawers are full, yet there are items in the cart. Uh, we're in a moment characterized by hyperabundance, both material and virtual. Even not having much uh, can be characterized by having too much stuff. Circulated by an ever-tightening culture commodity loop, uh, which makes what is culture today, product tomorrow. This excess is a main cause of both social inequity and en environmental problems alike. From the warehouse to the domestic interior, architecture is implicated in all aspects of this loop, uh, often as the intermedi intermediary between materials and materialism, uh, where resources are put in the service of keeping up with interior design trends, inventory fluctuation, fluctuations, or fads. Uh, to be in this now times is to embody the socio-material circumstances where a new uh, downstairs bathroom Pinterest folder is directly, direct, directly linked to sales of tiles and what is considered cute on social media affects material extraction demands all over. The following body of work begins from that abundance, from that excess that is around us, from the muchness we have produced and attempts to instill new life from it. So Stock is interested in this kind of material circulations and uh, through material temporalities. Uh, responding to the extreme availability of stuff and images, uh, it tends to function within kind of aesthetic low hanging fruit, like the screen, uh, often landing on sort of cliches, um, but often foregrounding a kind of interest in tectonics and parts, arguing that the geopolitical also exists in um, single bulk. Uh, so the work here focuses specifically on material temporalities through sort of reverse logistics, kind of like design for recirculation, through uh, rentals, a design for disassembly, and through surface, uh, recirculation through aesthetics. So first through reverse logistics, we'll go to sort of my older work. Um, Stock, the namesake of my sort of practice, uh, started in 2015. Stock is uh, a construction material and texture representation project created by leveraging big box store return policies on a $200 rotating credit, buying materials from these stores, staging them uh, in my studio, photographing them, and driving them back to return them. The project explores common documentation techniques found in construction material catalogs and reconstitutes them into an, alternat into an alternative catalog. It's a catalog of the catalog. Concerned with the act of accumulation, the project consists of the labor of sifting, combining, editing, transporting, and organizing both images and materials alike. What Stock really proposed was a method of producing work uh, with little funding by using the return policy, the fine, by using the, also the fine print of the commercial contract to gain access to resources that otherwise I wouldn't have had. Uh, while sidestepping sort of some of the larger flaws of the temporary architectural project, uh, waste, lack of funding, storage fees, et cetera, uh, replacing some of those with my own labor. Um, I had a lot more time than this. Um, the proposal engages the off-the-shelf, the ready-made on its own terms, confronting us with the options on, on how to use that which already exists to imbue the newness rather than produce anew, which is a recurring theme. Uh, Stock 
deploys many of the conventional commercial gimmicks, fetishizing objects through portraiture, studio lighting, and calculated backdrops, yet it offers no additional commercial value. No more or less cinder blocks were, uh, or flexible PVC plumbing elbows were sold in any given month because of stock. The project became a sort of template uh, for a number of future projects and an emblem of a sort of a scrappy approach to architecture uh, for what later became um, my namesake studio and a kind of interest in the sort of idea of returns and reverse logistics. Um, so reverse logistics uh, are essentially all the operations that happen after uh, Jesse's description of what logistics is. So all operations re related to the return of product and materials. Any process of management after the um, delivery of the product to the customer involves reverse logistics. Uh, Remanufacturing and refurbishing activities also may be included in the definition, um, although here I'll only focus on uh, returns for the most part. So to give you a, a sense of the, of the scale, uh, about eight to 10% of all uh, brick and mortar transactions uh, involve uh, returns, e-commerce is 20%, holiday, holiday e-commerce is 30%, and expensive products, such as uh, um, like tech products can account to almost 50%. Um, for uh, manufacturers, around 50% of their revenue is uh, spent on, on returns, so these are huge numbers we're talking about. Um, UPS became sort of in a, aware in a timely manner of uh, the kind of like numbers that were, were being uh, discussed because a lot of these uh, objects without a kind of infrastructure in place to how to handle them, they were essentially going straight to the landfill in, mo in many cases. Uh, so UPS led the charge for pub publishing the reverse logistics uh, uh, report uh, as it became aware that returns was a kind of a new normal. Uh, they're typically understood as the cost of, sort of just doing business uh, from a co the company's um, end. Uh, with the e-commerce boom, uh, returns obviously have skyrocketed with many companies starting uh, to profile and even ban sort of types of, of returners. Like uh, one's called the fitting rumor or the serial returner who buy a bunch of stuff knowing that they'll return all but one. Uh, or the wardrobes, uh, those who uh, buy things to use once and then return. That obviously applies more to, to garments, but in the case of my prior practice, I would have been the kind of material wardrober. Um, so e-commerce's uh, e dilemma is that most prof the most profitable customers are also the ones who return the most. Uh, they buy and return the most. So linking profit with the doubling of the sort of environmental impact of shipping. Uh, there are various ways in which this is kind of being addressed, uh, most being less sustainable and more profitable for the company, it's kind of the bigger preoccupation. Um, generally speaking, businesses streamlining reverse logistics is a good thing, um, as weak reverse logistics, as I mentioned before, lead to avoidable waste, with many companies until recently sort of not knowing how to handle returns and kind of di directly discarding them. That was not happening, um, that, was ha that was happening not, not, not too long ago. Um, Home Depot has actually been um, very celebrated for its efforts, so a company that now has like 2,000 uh, um, uh, retail locations has now four centralized locations uh, for to handle this kind of reverse logistics uh, since uh, 2015, um, where returns and other materials going back through the supply chain are handled. Um, Purple Crates, uh, culture of shipping, I started to kind of focus on, on the tools, uh, the actual sort of materiality of shipping um, and the culture that it produces around it uh, as a kind of facilitator for this like e-commerce boom. This is a project that I did during my fellowship uh, at Michigan in 2018. Um, so logistics have transcended or their origination as pragmatic instruments that have become social, sociological modes of operating, changing everything from our infrastructure to our habits. At a global scale, shipping and handling operates um, as part of an abstract black box data space of managed quantities and collapsed distances where all material fragments get reduced to a bounding box with a tracking number, a data point in the matrix of contemporary infrastructures. But at the human scale, it's a, it's a palpable object. There are cardboard boxes on the porch, the login needed to access the order's tracking number, the neighbor who signed for it, your in your absence, the color is all wrong, the size doesn't fit, send it back. 
Negotiating the exchange between these global and human scales are boxes, crates, containers, and other armatures of commodity mobility that are simultaneously material and immaterial, object and system. They're material in so far as they are actual containers with a physical form, uh, but also immaterial in that they cannot be disassociated from the informational traces that they bear. The box is the logistical unit of the material world, the bounding box, the metric of spatial thinking, a subliminal force in the construction of space, a form of thought, an ordering system, and also an icon. This transport containers organize, bind, shelter, and delimit content in anticipation of an economically bound spatial exchange, one that constantly attempts to regularize form, square it out, flatten it, standardize it, and turn it into a quantifiable data set. In a system that strives for efficiency, difficulty becomes an act of resistance and, a sh and uh, shape a potential act of irreverence. So the formal plasticity of careful crates um, contradicts the optimization of standardized shipping units and serves as material resistance to the bounding box economy. In, shipping, uh, in shipping's kind of boxy microeconomic logic, logic, the integrity of the perimeter casing with its details, handles, its protective edges, uh, the tight interior fit, the safe air gap, the soft cushion, the level landing, and the legible label are all economized. Negotiating um, what Walid Bashti calls the unbearable compromise of that which is portable. In fact, uh, FedEx owns the exact dimensions of a box, has a copyright to not just the design of a box, uh, but a proprietary volume of, volume of space. So FedEx owns a shape. Uh, shipping, of course, has changed the global landscape, while at the human scale it is fundamentally changing our relationship to stuff, how we acquire and how we own it. Shipping imbues a state of transience on all things. Notions of uh, ownership get replaced with convenience and timely arrival. The more frictionless the acquisition process, the more intermittent our ownership. Buy and return or sell or move or store or try or replace, not own. Objects perpetually in circulation instill onto us an endemic mobility. Uh, while focusing on the box as a proxy ob object, the project uh, kind of led to larger sociological conclusions. Cultural changes brought about by the ubiquity of shipping um, and points out to sort of four realms, or sort of four big conclusions that I'm sort of making um, that some of, the, some of these changes are mo most manifest in this kind of four um, areas. Uh, new material temporalities, retail entertainment, image fidelity investment and circulation assemblies. Uh, by material temporalities, I mean the transient uh, nature of how we own objects and commodities now, always in circulation. Uh, by retail entertainment, I mean brick and mortars uh, turn to pop up everything. Image fidelity investment, where I um, speculate that retailers are gonna be investing in um, more clear and interactive communications of their products uh, through digital tools uh, to essentially a swash like uh, a customer's expecta exact expectations of a product uh, in order to reduce the amount of back and forths. Um, and it's introducing a kind of new circulation assemblage, uh, uh, te tectonic perhaps, where physical methods of protecting, moving, and assembling parts without damage becomes more necessary and prevalent. Um, so Careful Crates also included a short video uh, and, and animations, a kind of project featuring comedian Anna Fabrega, attempting to explain how global shipping networks like, operate and then rating a kind of, uh, the quality of different containers based on a subjective criteria unclear to the audience. Um, ultimately, the video kind of serves as a sociology of like industry cliches and alternative history of like to the efficiency of um, shipping. Uh, circulation assembly uh, explores the tectonics of material temporalities. Uh, it's a prototype of a temporary assemblage system that uh, composes architectural elements while helping maintain their integrity in order to have a kind of likelier future value or utility. This project looks at uh, shipping and art handling as a source of assemblage proposals. As objects come to negotiate other objects, packaging uh, and packaging, protective elements and, and um, protective elements and anticipate machines and movement, Shipping is a source for uh, circulatory kind of proto-architectures. 
the project begins to develop an adaptable assembly system using kind of these system objects that we call them. Uh, these are components that function in the service of other objects. Uh, the, aim to, the aim is to maintain a temporary relationship between the uh, material components so that they can be taken apart, moved around, uh, changed in configuration, and or otherwise returned to circulation. These are edge protectors, two-way, three-way cushioning, strap loops, face pallets, um, ratchet straps, zip ties, clamps, adjustable joinery, spacers, levelers, wedges. Uh, here the box is not really a proposal, uh, but becomes a kind of testing unit, a prototype, a shape that imbues all the problems needed for my own kind of architectural prototyping, edges, corners, faces, a way to negotiate the ground, a need for being held together, a perfect 3D kind of test dummy. Uh, while kind of looking at um, this project for clues on how one might scale these techniques up in order to kind of apply these techniques to a more, more to temporize other architectures. Um, designing through rentals, design for disassembly. Um, this is a project that just came down in, in LA at uh, Materials and Applications uh, storefront called A Kid of the Some Parts Budget Gym. It's an exhibition um, and a video game and some public programming. It's a temporary architectural assembly uh, in service of the activity. In this case, the activity of working out. Co-opting the formulas of uh, rentable event tents, so think uh, wedding tents and information booths, where poles, panels, tension straps, and tarps complete otherwise generic structural frames. The project intertwines a few custom elements with generic ones and, ima and images, um, generic ones and images, uh, sorry, generic ones, images with budget materials, um, and provide a set of parts that ultimately come to form a gym. Uh, it turns to ma material diversion tactics from DIY cultural production where often low budget material assemblies are re-aestheticized and reassembled to serve future uses. Um, refinishing the, the same materials over and over here becomes both an accessible approach to aesthetic renewal as much as it is a kind of an environmental tactic. Resting on the straightforwardness of its base, good green, um, it instead focuses its design agency in developing auxiliary items and developing non-invasive attachment techniques that allow for the dismantling and redistribution of the parts that make this kit, um, again, available for future uses. The project proposes assembly rather than construction, using rather than owning, refinishing rather than repurchasing as ways of creating an architectural kit that equally considers its own futurity as well as aesthetics. The kit includes I'm going to go for another list. A structural system, foam padding, water weights or ballasts, tape, tarp for shade or privacy, ratchet straps as a structural tie, shims, foundation adjustment, um, inflatable donage bags as furniture or padding, sandbags as counterweights, and vacuum form panels as shade or privacy as well. Uh, it's a kind of architectural microcosm in a way. Strapped together and padded up, gym meets view line. Um, it also includes a, a prototype for a video game where uh, one can customize a kind of future version of the project by interacting with the catalog of parts. Um, the project kind of ultimately later became a demo kit for the next project I'm about to present um, and expanded into a kind of an attempt at an architecture rental business called SomeParts.Parts, um, which consists of, of, a, of a website and a set inventory of structural and auxiliary items that one can customize and thematize, um, limited, customize and thematize, um, select a structural kit, size and configure, um, and we will kind of deliver it to your event. So the project's initial interest was to try to instrumentalize the gallery space from the prior project. Um, the kind of gallery space which commonly deals in an economy of exposure and kind of more conceptual thinking in order to launch an actual business, see if I could do it. Um, so some parts uses this kind of modul modular deployable architectural kit that I've been developing and adapts, adapts it to many uh, potential scales and uses from furniture to party tents to provisional stage set. So it, propose, it pro proposes to provide a more, a more aestheticized yet less branded version of an existing market of event-based architecture and to do so through less sort of waste, wasteful cyclical me methods. Uh, to continuously serve new events, the kit relies on disassembly and budget customization methods, 
These include reprint reprinting, um, cleaning, repainting, retaping, etc. Architecturally, it relies on non-invasive non uh, assembly methods using nuts and bolts instead of nails, ratchet straps instead of glue, and standard sizes rather than custom ones. The standard sizes uh, is key uh, as it allows me to size based on a sort of search and all the results uh, of that search can kind of apply to the kit. So I can like look up one by one in any kind of catalog um, and any object that comes up could be a, a seat or a, a, a tile um, uh, can become kind of part of the kit. So the project is like, it's, you know, it's still very much in a kind of exhibition space, but um, there is an attempt in the summer of 2020 to kind of get it out of the exhibition space and turn it into like, give it a go at a sort of making it into a real business. Uh, the kind of the, the, the plinth that is on exhibition uh, as part of uh, the symposium is kind of part of this thinking too. Uh, thank you for the student that actually put it together. Sorry, it was aggressive. Um, so um, I, have one, I have one more quick project to present. I think maybe I'll be like three minutes. Um, so this is the kind of attempt at referencing the media card, which we, I took the opportuni opportunity for the symposium to develop a kind of set of instructions for the kit, um, to be clear. Um, so this, I won't have time to present. It was a version of the kit for a performance in Berlin. Sorry, there's a lot of content here. Um, the, the, the performance couldn't be documented, so then I got to do whatever I wanted with the kind of um, objects and the video in the background. So that's what you saw there was just me uh, playing. Uh, so recirculation through aesthetics. Um, it's a work in progress for the fall 2020 as part of a group exhibition that includes um, Ang Lee, who's uh, in the audience, we were just talking about it, uh, at MOCAD, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, who I'll be working on a couple projects with over the next year. Uh, this project is called uh, postcommodity.services. Uh, post it's a proposal for a business that offers to kind of radically resurface, a, a radical resurfacing service to clients. Uh, so postcommodity.services speculates on the afterlife of stuff, unwanted stuff, it wants uh, that stuff that you have in the storage unit and proposes to radically resurface it as a way of reinventing it and putting it back into circulation. Kind of hardcore interior decor. Um, it proposes spraying, wallpapering, dipping, etc. cetera, um, all your unwanted objects in perpetuity as an aesthetic layering and renewal for your home office. Anyway, the project places itself between the culture that produces the desires for newness and the infrastructures that are in place to handle the discard produced by those desires and attempts to create a kind of new economic mini loop um, within that, producing new value from that which is existing uh, or making you deal with it, which are however one chooses to see it. Um, that, but it produces that by only changing its image, right? Like so only the surface while keeping the material core. Um, for the full exhibition, which focuses on polymers, um, we'll be spraying a room with kind of pulverized, recycled rubber, like really pulverized, um, which I'm excited about. Manipulating the surface and not the substrate becomes key here. Delaminating the image space uh, from the rest of the kind of material strata of the object. It wonders uh, what does designing uh, look like if we're not allowed to buy more objects, if we had to deal with the ones that we already have, and how might designing through a client look like in a post-commodity context. Thank you.